we gather in this day on a cold, chilly, slippy day. And we gather from the cold into the warmth, not only of the building, but certainly the warmth of meeting with friends, of sharing with each other, of worship, and of realizing the presentness of God here and in our lives as we journey. As we gather this day, may we know that presence and may we feel the warmth of a loving God. I'd like to welcome all those who might be visiting with us this morning. I'm certainly honored that you've made your way here to be with us on this chilly day. And you're invited to come downstairs afterwards to share in some coffee and tea and, um, and refreshments and cookies and stuff uh, downstairs in the auditorium, in the gymnasium. Also, we have a large following of folk who tune in each Sunday to be part of this worship in the East Link and a warm welcome to you as well as uh, you share in this worship with us this day. As we gather, we are mindful of those who um, are experiencing loss in their lives and we extend to uh, Wilson Ross and Susan and Gaylene on the death of uh, Wilson's wife Kay and Susan and Gaylene's mom Kay Ross and that funeral took place earlier this week. Also, uh, um, uh, our sympathies are extended to uh, Errol Andrews and the death of his sister, uh, Doreen Andrews, and I just received that news this morning. The funeral will be on Thursday at 10.30 at Belvedere Funeral Home, and uh, for more information you can find it on their website regarding the visitation. Also, we have several birthdays today. Nathan Mayer's birthday. Happy birthday, Nathan. And uh, Albert Aiken is, uh, is uh, also celebrating. And our custodian, or one of our custodians, Lorraine Wirth, is also celebrating a birthday as well on February 10th. And it, this was going to slip by, but a little bird tweeted in my ear this morning to say that Wendy's birthday, is it today, Wendy? Today is Wednesday, Wendy's birthday, so please make sure you wish her a happy birthday. <laughs> She's looking back at her mom, giving that eye, you know. We certainly appreciate those who participate in worship as well, and certainly we thank Barb Stewart, who's going to be sharing in uh, uh, reading scripture this morning, so thank you, Barb. Uh, to Gordon Worth, who will be sharing in our pastoral prayer, and also to Luke Duran, who's our liturgist this morning. So Luke is sharing in, uh, in, uh, in, in worship this morning, Luke the Duke. And also Noah for lighting our candle this morning. Thank you. And our PowerPoint slide creator this week was Barb Prouse, so we certainly appreciate Barb's work. In your bulletin, I would ask that you note the annual meeting time. It takes place on February 18th, a storm date the 25th. So there's a, an announcement there, there regarding sandwiches and that sort of stuff and times. So please have a look at that. It is in your bulletin. Uh, so just have another look at that to make sure. Also, Kathy is away on vacation study leave, and she's going to be returning on February 11th, and I can't wait for her to come back. <laughs> so uh, we're looking forward to Kathy's return, February 11th. Also, the Bible study, uh, Living the Questions, Uppity Women of the Bible. It was such a success last fall that Kathy Crooks will be leading a study of another uppity woman, and her name is Esther. Now, you don't have to take my... I know when the word came out of uppity women in the fall, people were a little leery of coming to that and saying, oh, do I really want to go do a study on uppity women? Well, don't take my word for it. Take the words of those who gathered round and had the discussion and had lots of laughter and certainly had a good time together and learned a lot as well. So please come on out and join Kathy uh, uh, this, uh, in the next couple of weeks. It is in your bulletin. And... Uh, uh, come on out and enjoy that time together. There are a host of other items in your bulletin, so I just hold those up to you to make sure you have a look at those and note the different events that are happening. And Norman Carruthers is going to have a few words with us. Good morning. Good morning. This is your last chance to get tickets for the Tuesday night church supper. 
at 6 p.m. Tickets are $10 and they'll be available after church from John Edmund. And also on Saturday, February 17th at 5.30 is the roast beef dinner. And those tickets are available after church as well. Thank you very much. Let us uh, now realize the presence in symbolism as Noah comes forward to light our Christ candle for us this morning. See, it keeps going out there. Let's try that. Not working for us this morning, is it? I think sometimes we just gotta go. There we go. Give me one more time. Let's see. <coughs> Thank you very much. <coughs> Gather us, let us now take a time of preparation, as quiet preparation, as we prepare ourselves for uh, worship so that God might speak to us in this time. Please join me in the call to worship, and uh, please respond in the darkened text. Gather us in, the brokenhearted and the joyful. Gather us in, the weak and the strong. Gather us in, the fearful and the brave. Gather us in, the young and the old. Gather us in, to sing of God's works. Gather us in, to praise Jesus Christ. Gather us in, to worship and wonder. Come, let us worship our God. Please join in hymn number 12 and more voices. Come touch our hearts.
please join me in the opening prayer. Weaver of our lives, you womb in love. May we not who are gathered here be empowered by that love to weave new patterns of truth and justice into a web of life. We are held in a web that is strong and beautiful, connecting all together. In this time of gathering, remind us that no one stands alone, that you weaving his unconditional love holds us together. In this love, we are called to live. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, now please join me in uh, a hymn, Ferris, Lord Jesus. And uh, while this hymn's going on, can the children please gather at the front? Well, good morning. Here we go. There's a good morning. Do I have another good morning? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> it's a great morning. Is it nice out? Is it really, really warm and balmy? Kind of chilly, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. This morning, I want to talk about, I'm going to share a word with you. I don't know if you know what it means, a miracle. Have you ever heard the word miracle? Yes. No. Have you heard the word miracle, what a miracle might be? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could be. I wonder. Could be. You know, I'm thinking... Have you ever been surprised by something? Like you didn't think... Mm -hmm. Pardon? Yeah, a surprise. Have you ever went somewhere and you said, Oh, this is going to be boring. And then you went and you was like, Wow! Yeah. Is it Disney World was like that? Did you think it was going to be boring when you went? Oh, you didn't go. Okay. If you were on the train and waiting trip, you okay. Take a long time. That's right. So, sort of a miracle is a surprise. Like we're thinking, oh my gosh, how did that ever happen? And you know this earth that we live on? Everybody see the earth? Did you watch videos of the earth? And you know what the galaxy is? Is all the planets and everything? You've got a book about it. Yeah. Your mom gave it to you. I bet it's a pretty good book, too. Well, you know what? Way, 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 way back, 
there was what they call a big bang. And all of a sudden, something happened that different planets got created. And the earth was one of them. Like, that's many, like billions of years ago. So that would have been like a miracle because it was a surprise. How did that ever happen? Wow, can you get your head around that? That's pretty awesome, isn't it? Kind of weird, I know. And miracles are like that. Weird. Yeah. So I'm going to show you another miracle. I have a miracle right in this bag, this little thing here. Right in here. There are several miracles right in here. What do you think? Huh? Let me open it up. Look at all these miracles. What are they? Why do you think that, why do you think I call those seeds miracles? I touched you touched one, you bet you did. Why do I think that do you think that these seeds, say you didn't know that things grew from them, and you looked at one of those, would you think that anything would grow from a dried up old seed like that? I don't think so. If we didn't know that seeds grew trees and flowers and all those things, we would say, oh, that's just a silly old seed. It doesn't grow. It's going to die. It sounds, looks all dead. I'm going to put the seeds right back in here, okay? There we go. Oops, yeah, because we have stuff growing. So a little seed like that, if we plant it, a miracle happens. Voila. Look here. Look at this. What do you think of this? It's a, it's a real one. It's not plastic, okay? <laughs> so how do you think this, this began? Where did it grow? Where did it begin? From a seed. A little tiny seed. That's right. Well, it was something. It was a seed. And we planted the seed. No, those, no this is real. This is a real plant. Yeah, I said it wasn't fake. There we go. Yeah, I wouldn't do that to you. Yeah. So, this little seed, and we thought the seed was sort of all dried up, not going to do anything. And we plant it in the earth. We put some water on it. We fertilize it. That's how it grows. And you know what? That's, that's a miracle. Because it's surprising that a little old seed could grow this. And you know what I think? That's, no, this one's real. Those are real too. And that one's real. That one's real. That's right. Now, I think that behind all of this, there is a wonderful love. A huge, big love. And you know what that love is? God. Did you ever think of God as like love? That even with little seeds, God grows things. And you know, with our lives as we grow up, and as we think about God, and as we feel God really close to us, that's like seeds in our lives. The light is always with us because the light is Jesus. All men, sister. I couldn't have said it better. Let's have a prayer. Hi, God. Thank you for seeds. And thank you for your big, huge love that surprises us and creates wonderful miracles that surprise us. Talk to you later, God. Amen. Thank you so much. Pardon? Ah, my, yeah. It, oh, my tooth. Yes, it did come out. I'm getting a new one, though.
Our reading this morning from Isaiah. <clears throat> Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is God who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in, who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when God blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom, then, will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. God brings out their host and numbers them, calling them all by name. Because God is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O oh, Jacob, and speak, O oh, Israel? My way is hidden, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? God is the everlasting, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not faint or grow weary. God's understanding is unsearchable. God gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for God shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And our response of reading this morning is Psalm 147, and we'll ask Dawn and the choir to lead us in the sung response. <clears throat> good it is to sing praises to God. You are building Jerusalem, O God, and gathering the scattered exiles of Israel. You count the number of the stars and call them all by their names. You raise up the lowly. Sing to God in thanksgiving. Make music on the harp to our God. You give the cattle their food and the young ravens when they cry. But your delight is in those who revere you. Let us continue to allow sacred scripture, sacred stories to settle on us and may we find the sense of the holy in the reading of these scriptures and certainly in the reading of our storyteller we have come to know as Mark. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, 
And they told him about her at once. And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered round the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. And he answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I have come to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. May these words find a place in our hearts and minds, and may we hold the presence of God in our lives very tightly. And may we live and celebrate life as we are called. Amen. Will you join with me in a time of prayer? Holy One, great potter, creator, may you take the words 
that I say and the thoughts that I share. And may you make them and mold them to our ears, to our lives individually. And may you, O oh God, speak deeply to who we are, the vision and to the love that only you can do. We ask this in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. I've been in ministry for over 20 years. You're probably looking and saying, my gosh, he's such a young looking guy. 20 years? 20 plus years? <laughs> and you know, there's certain things throughout ministry and throughout our lives, but certain things that are highlighted along the journey of my ministry of 20 something years, 20 plus years, certain stories. I remember very early in my ministry, I was called by a family to visit their elderly mother, and I was informed that she was going to die. Period. These times, I find, are always tender times. And depending on the situation, it's always full of sadness. But depending on the situation, it's sometimes a great sense of relief to allow someone to die after a, a good life. I arrived at the house, uh, the home, the senior's home, and I was greeted by a doctor friend who briefed me on the situation. Actually, the doctor was a member of the family. She said, my grandmother is elderly. She's in a coma. She's not going to get better. Her vitals are very low. And the prospects of her coming out of this is non-existent. She's dying. The job, she said, of the medical staff at this point was to keep her comfortable, to make sure she didn't have any pain. So I entered the room, and it was just how, my, how the doctor had described this beautiful old woman with whom I'd had many a conversations and shared many a cup of tea with, was lying very quietly in bed. It was obvious that she didn't have any pain. She looked, actually, as if she was going asleep, having a deep sleep. There were family members present in the room, and we chatted a little bit, and then I made my way to the bedside of my good old friend, and I held her hand and I spoke tenderly to her. There was no response. And finally, after visiting a while, I suggested that the family might join me in a prayer with my friend who was going to die shortly. And they gathered around the bed, and I prayed a prayer that essentially said, you know what, it's okay to die. You've lived a long, a very good life, and now it's time to let go, and that love never lets us go. Love is always with us. God's love, God's embrace. Well, I left that room thinking it would be my last visit with this beautiful person, and I prepared to have a phone call from the undertaker, the funeral home, telling me of her death. The next day I ventured back to the home to check in on the family and to see how they were doing. And to my surprise, when I opened the door, my friend who was at death's door was sitting up in bed, having a bite to eat, very much alive, and in conversation with her family. To tell you I was surprised would be probably a bit of an understatement. She lived another two years. A miracle? A fluke? Bad medical advice? I don't know. 
But if it's, a, if it's indeed a miracle, it causes some challenges to my thinking. The other side of the coin, I've sat with families who have grieved great loss and have ha asked the question after great struggles with death, what have I done wrong for God, to God that God didn't answer my prayer and my loved one wasn't healed? Greg, we believe in miracles. We have prayed. We've been faithful all of our lives, and our 16-year-old son was a good kid. So why did he die? Why did God not answer my prayer, but answered somebody else's prayer? No miracle feels more like an abandonment by God. Mark has Jesus going to Simon's house, learning that Simon's mother-in-law is sick. And the story says that he healed her instantly. And of course, the other part of it being back in that day, she got up and began to serve all the people in the house. And Mark goes even further in his storytelling and suggests that the word spread throughout the whole area about this miraculous healing and the whole city gathered round Simon's door, and Jesus cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And following a night of prayer, Jesus travels throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message and casting out more demons. Now, I'll be brutally honest with you this morning, as I hope I try to be brutally honest most of the time. Considering all of those other times, that I've experienced in my life of people with real deep questions about where they are in relationship to God, when there are no miracles, then this gospel passage feels rather cruel to me. It begs the question, where is God most of the time when a healing doesn't take place? Or if not downright cruel, then at least it's inaccessible to most of us. What are we supposed to do with Jesus' healing stories today? The problem with miracles, Barbara Brown Taylor writes, and she's an Anglican priest in the United States and a theologian, and she says, the problem with miracles is that it is hard to witness them without wanting one of your own. Every one of us knows someone who is suffering. Every one of us knows someone who could use a miracle, but miracles are hard to come by. And to complicate matters, I have heard comments to people struggling with their illness, struggling with death. God is using the sickness to build your character. God is preparing you for something great. Satan is testing you. Be strong. You need to have more faith. Maybe there's a secret sin in your life. Have you tried confession? God's timing is different than ours. Be patient. These statements assume health, wholeness, and comfort are the norms we should expect to experience in this life if we truly follow God. If we don't experience health, wholeness, and comfort, then it is us who are doing something wrong. We are the ones that are out of sorts, and God is dealing out that punishment the Gospels only record, actually, about three dozen of Jesus' miracles altogether. I wonder if there were times when Jesus visited a feverish woman, took her hand, and offered only the comfort of his presence. No cure. Did he ever tell a chronically ill child, I can't take away your pain, but I love you, and I'll try my best to help you bear it? 
Did he ever encounter an unclean spirit he didn't or couldn't cast out? Did he ever sit in the dark with a profoundly depressed person and just sat with that person in that pain? Did he ever keep vigil at a bedside and cry with the family as they said goodbye? No resurrection, just tears. You see, Mark's Jesus came to proclaim the kingdom of God, not to eliminate the world's diseases and despair. Unlike some of the rhetoric I've heard, Jesus never glamorized healing. If anything, he seemed to be embarrassed by the attention that he was getting and usually told people to don't go away and don't, don't talk about it. Keep it quiet. Now, I'm not saying that miracles don't happen. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is the way that we identify them in our lives does not create Wholeness, but rather presents more challenges of this God we call love. And sometimes our relationship with God is complicated because we expect that to be faithful and to have God's ear is to get healing. Whenever I claim this person is healed by God, there are a thousand others who must accept the fact that God passed them over. And how terribly hard that must be. So if in the building of a kingdom of God, Mark's theme is having Jesus oppose the forces of evil which would rob the children of God of all that God hopes and intends for them, then we need to re-image, to rethink, to remold what these miracles mean for us today. Now, I've experienced miracles, and the greatest miracles that I have experienced, even greater than if we can call my good old friend who was supposed to die who didn't, call that a miracle, is even greater than that. I've seen the greatest miracles where God was most convincingly present when I've seen people offer a steady present presence with those who were suffering. When I experienced a person on the street out here collecting or sitting on the curb and someone goes over and stoops down and takes the time to talk with that person, takes the time to offer something for that person, maybe take them in for a coffee or something to eat, that's a miracle. When people have made it their ministry to restore community, to restore family and dignity to those who must walk through this life sick, weak, and wounded, without cures, without miracles, that, my friends, is a miracle. When people have spoken out and marched for better health care on PEI, have gone out and stood up by Province House because the mental health program on PEI is not adequate, that's a miracle. And that's standing against that which takes away and robs God's children, God's people of health and wholeness. That's a miracle. When the many women stand up throughout this country and around the world and who say, you know what? The abuse, the sexual abuse that has happened to me at the hands of certain men in power is not acceptable. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. When people have made sure that no one, no one has to die alone, unloved, that's a miracle. When we put people's lives front and center in church and in community, rather than protecting buildings, that's a miracle. And that's what we're called to be about. Yes, we'll make mistakes. Yes, we'll stumble. Yes, we'll never feel that we are as much as we could be or what we're called to be. But the miracles happen. They're happening here. I've seen it. And they'll continue. 
And in those miracles, no one goes away feeling that God had favorites, that somehow one was more important than the other. Miracles are difficult things to deal with. But miracles are a part of our life, part of our faith, and part of our calling as a people. Go out. Leave this church. Go forth and be the miracle worker that you are called to be. In the name of Jesus the Christ. So let it be. Amen. God, whose almighty word chaos and darkness heard and took their flight, hear us, we humbly pray, and where the gospel day sheds not its glorious ray, let there be light. Number 313, in Voices United, God, whose almighty word. Good morning. My name, my name is Graham Linkletter. I'm chair of the property committee. And I just wanted to discuss a few things that the property committee is doing and has done in the past while. The property committee has responsibility for repair and maintenance of the buildings and grounds, implementation of safety and security measures, implementation of energy efficiency measures and the maximizing of building accessibility. The major undertaking last year was the masonry and structural repair of the two brick towers and the repointing of the bricks on the west gable end. Several of the buttresses footings and the buttresses themselves were repaired. Flashings were placed at the top of the capstones and all on seven of the buttresses and uh, also over the uh, arch at the main Prince Street doors. Numerous re other repairs and maintenance work has been carried out including painting of several classrooms, repainting the crests that are affixed to the towers, graffiti removal, 
inventory of furniture and equipment and the planting of three Japanese maple trees on the front lawn. Several emergency exit lights were upgraded and the fire safety plan was completed. One emergency evacuation drill was conducted during the Sunday service. A CPR and AED course was held for staff, ushers, and other key personnel. The maximum seating capacity in the sanctuary and the balcony was established for large concert events. Investigations are continuing to upgrade the main Prince Street sliding wood doors to make them energy efficient, operable during the winter months, and at the same time meet the city's heritage and fire code requirements. The former ladies' washroom was totally reconstructed as a barrier-free, all-gender washroom. A new and larger ladies' washroom was also constructed. Projects for the coming year will focus on continuing with the masonry repair, general maintenance, and projects relating to safety and security. So thank you very much, and if you have any questions, uh, just approach me in the gym later on. Thank you. Good morning. No, I'm not here for the Christmas fair. <laughs> Good morning. I am Linda Dunning, and I am the chair of the worship committee. Ever, ever wonder what happens uh, be behind the scenes to set us up for each uh, Sunday morning? Well, this happens as part of the worship committee. We give oversight and provide support to the worship experience here at Trinity Clifton. The worship committee is responsible for so supporting the ministry, the music director, and for helping with the leadership in worship. We spend time planning and visioning with the ministry personnel and the music director. Worship is a collaboration, and we have to all work together. We also manage the sanctuary and the chapel. We prepare communion. We make sure that ushering is in place, bulletins are in place, that the flowers, the decorations for Thanksgiving and for Christmas, and all of the seasonal changes, right down to changing the runner on the table and the antependum on the front of the... Uh, we support and approve all alternative uses of the sanctuary and of the chapel below us. We keep the pulse of what is happening here at Trinity Church. Would you like to be part of our committee? We'd love to have you. The worship committee meets once per month, the second Tuesday of the month, and we meet at 4.30, usually in the parlor. Thank you. As you see, there's many, many ways to offer ourselves and to share the gifts that we have. Certainly the committee and the, um, Phil Floyd, which is right there, is looking for people to be on committees, and if you're interested, he would love to speak with you. Uh, it's an opportunity to share your gifts and to, to help create Trinity and to mold Trinity. Um, and also another way in which we, of course, continue the ministry is by the generous gifts of so many people through money offerings. And at this time, uh, we'd invite you to off make your offering. We give as we are able. We give as we are called. Your morning offering will now be received.
Please join me in prayer. We are grateful to be your people, to be called, to be generous, to be in ministry in your world. Bless our gifts, our giving, and our hopes for a world in which your will is done. Amen. The human heart, who but you, O oh God, can know it? We are told in scripture that you alone know us in our inward parts. We are also told that the human heart is nothing if not deceitful. But more than anything else, the human heart lusts and it strives. And it makes up its own reasons and justifications for what it does. It is prone to pride, a taking of the world by storm. And that's a rub. The prideful human heart is of the world. But it is when the human heart becomes wounded and cast back upon itself that you, are God, that you, O God, are there. King David the psalmist had a crisis of the heart. The enormity of his crime would today be considered psychopathic and could be expressed in the cliched slogan, because I can. But David was all too aware of the dark side of his human pride, and he faced it. He asked you to create in him, and we all know this, a clean heart, to renew him in a right spirit, and to restore in him the joy of your salvation. The preacher in Ecclesiastes is known for his thoughts on vanity, he encouraged the human heart to enjoy that which is natural and to give reverence to that which is of the spirit. But he reminds us that you have created us upright, but that we have sought out many a clever invention and have despised the very existence of the poor. Mary, the mother of Jesus, told of how you have scattered the imaginations of proud hearts and have filled the poor with good things. The Apostle James says that you resist the proud but give grace to the humble. Robbie Burns spent a life in a tug of war between pride and humility. Pride in considering himself independent and untainted by the world, but humbled in the sheer awe in which he held the immensity of all, and this is from Acts, that lives and moves and has its being. But Byrne met pride and vanity head on in his familiar poem, for all that and all that. But he stares down those of heart and pride when he asks, why am I subject to his cruelty and scorn? Or why has man the will and power to make his fellow mourn? But in entering a plea for the struggling poor, he writes, they never ask amiss who seek the Lord aright. Burns was talking about heart. Well, we as believers are called to go straight out into a realm which has long seemed to be the exclusive world of the proud and the vain. And yet, all are to hear the gospel of Christ, the ruler and the captive alike. Keep us, we pray, from falling into our own self-consuming and vanity-driven ways. Help us to let our all too human heart be humble and merciful. And help us to know that even if our hearts condemn us, that you are greater than our hearts, and that it is in your love alone that the torment of condemnation is cast out. And let us remember that you have loved us first from the beginning, and that your first commandment is that we are to love before all else. We are to live 
and labor among both the proud and the, and the vain, and the contrite, the brokenhearted, and the poor in spirit. In his music, Van Morrison tells us to keep keeping on till the healing has begun. Let the healing and saving grace of Jesus Christ wash over us. Send your comforter to revive us and refresh us. Your spirit, O oh God, is a quickening spirit. Quicken our hearts, we pray, to know what it is that our heart truly desires. Heart matters. This we know from the life and the love of Jesus Christ. You know our hearts, O oh God. Make our hearts whole, we pray, in your abiding love. In Ecclesiastes, we are told that whatever the human tide or weather, we are, we are to cast our bread upon the waters. We are to go forth in the assurance given by Jesus Christ that my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Let our hearts be turned to faith and to overcoming and to life everlasting. You who speak to our hearts and give us to know you in spirit and in truth, deliver us unto your glory. You who are God. Amen. Please join together in hymn number six, 691 in uh, Voices United Through Ancient Walls.
The spirit, the spirit dances here among us. The Christ goes with us on our way. The Holy One gives you power to give this song to those whom you meet. Go now in peace and in celebration.